This video is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. I mean ExpressVPN. Wait. No, I mean nothing. Oh, hello there. You've caught me thinking about strings. Not in the context of sewing or in computer jargon, but in the context of musical instruments. We all know about guitars, violins, and tissue boxes with elastic bands wrapped around them. But most of us don't know about their predecessors. What led to the modern day strings as we know them? And why do they all look so similar? A chordophone, which comes from the Greek chord meaning string and phonos meaning voice or sound, is defined by Encyclopedia Britannica as any of a class of musical instruments in which a stretched, vibrating string produces the initial sound. The five basic types are bows, harps, lutes, lyres, and zivers. Those five basic types are very general and huge variation exists within each of them. For example, there are many types of lyre throughout history, but they vary massively. Some are played with a bow while others are played with a plectrum. Some are small and some are quite big, but they all fall under the umbrella term lyre. So chordophones basically include any instrument you can think of that has strings on it. And just to be clear, the title of this video is obviously pure clickbait because not all stringed instruments look the same. I mean, if you look at a picture of a piano and think it looks the same as a violin, it's likely that you either lost your vision in a horrible string-related accident, or your glasses are severely fogged up. But many stringed instruments do in fact have similar shapes, mechanisms, and physical properties, and while I was thinking about this, I thought it would be interesting to look into the development of stringed instruments through time. So today I'm going to take a poop break, but go watch these videos after this one, and discuss the origins and development of the string family, chordophones. It's going to be a long one probably, so I'll provide timestamps for the sections in the description. First, a history lesson. This is thought to be the first stringed instrument, it's called a musical bow, and it's speculated to date back to 13,000 BC. The reason being that a cave painting in the Trois Frères caves in France seemed to depict a man dressed in a bison costume and herding bison while playing something resembling a musical bow. And you know what? I can really see it. This is an engraving of the cave painting, and he's definitely holding a vaguely bow-shaped thing. He's holding it up to his mouth, which is often how a musical bow is played, as we'll see in a second. And there aren't any dead bison there that I can really tell, so I guess that suggests that it's not a weapon. But obviously take it with a very large grain of salt, because this was drawn by a bored man in a cave 15,000 years ago. Anyway, there's a really interesting video from Sorrow Sorrow TV. I won't show it because I don't think I'm allowed to, but I'll link it in the description and it shows the modern musical bow being played by a member of the Akele tribe in Gabon. It's quite interesting and well worth a watch after this video, of course. So the way the instrument works is that they have a curved pole and they stretch the string between each end exactly like a longbow and they strike the string with a stick or they pluck it with their fingers. They produce different pitches by shortening the length of the string using a knife or a stick which creates a higher string tension meaning that when you strike the string the wavelength of the vibrations produced will be shorter and it will produce a higher pitched sound. Because stringed instruments need a resonator to actually produce a sound, the player puts their mouth against the top part of the string, which essentially acts as a resonation chamber or a speaker for the instrument. Vibration from the string goes into the mouth, reverberates, and then comes out as the sound. It's exactly the same concept as when you make different pitches by opening and closing your mouth while using an electric toothbrush. The point is, now that we understand what a musical bow is, how it's played and what it looks like, we can surmise that the thing being held in this cave painting looks suspiciously like a musical bow. So this is probably the first chordophone that we have evidence of. Recently I've been reading the Slow Cooker Bible. It's a great read, and in it, the author describes how people eventually got really bored of the one string on their musical bows with its limited tonal possibilities, and the fact that you couldn't play chords unless you had three different players at the same time who all knew about harmony even though it wasn't invented yet. So the ancient Mesopotamians, that clever bunch, decided to invent tuning systems in order to expand their tonal range and to allow to have multiple strings on one instrument. Then they realised they could stick a load of these new tunable strings onto a big wooden box which would act as a much better resonation chamber than their ancient Mesopotamian mouths. This led to the first tunable stringed instruments like lutes and lyres. Speaking of lyres, the lyres of Ur were discovered in the Royal Cemetery of Ur, located in what is modern-day Iraq, but at the time was within ancient Mesopotamia. 
They date back to the 3rd, early dynastic period of ancient Mesopotamia around 2500 BC, which makes them around 4500 years old-ish. Now that's quite old, but they didn't survive for that long completely unscathed. Given that they were made of wood, which rots over time, and had strings made of presumably guts or animal hair, most of the lyres had been reclaimed by nature by the time that they were discovered. However, some parts of the instruments were decorated with non-perishable materials like gold and silver, so those parts all survived. This is an image of the restored Queen's Lyre, which is kept in the Iraq Museum in Baghdad. Now, I kept reading that the lyres of Ur were actually the second oldest lyres that have been found, with the oldest ones being the ones found in the Mycop culture. But the thing is, I couldn't find any hard evidence of this, like I couldn't find any papers about the instrument or any images that were like verified to be of it. All I found were posts on Pinterest saying, ooh, this is uh, the oldest stringed instrument with no like citation. And I don't really consider Pinterest posts to be real evidence. But what we can deduce is that the first lyres are at least about 4,500 years old if we're referring to the lyres of Ur, but potentially even older than that if the Mycops did indeed have them. We all know what a harp is, and on the face of it, lyres look to essentially be miniature harps, just a handheld version. However, there are some key differences between harps and lyres which separate them. The lyres are traditionally played with a plectrum, rather than with the fingers like a harp, and the free hand would be used to mute the unplayed strings. Because of this, lyres tended to be mainly melodic instruments, playing single melodies at a time or utilising a droning note with the melody. Chords not so much. Comparatively, harps are and were usually used as chordal instruments rather than melodic instruments for accompanying and things like that. The second main difference is to do with the way that the instrument is constructed and strung. A lyre consists of a body which is either a box or a bowl shaped, two arms, one on each side, and a crossbar that goes between them. The strings are tied at the crossbar where they can be tuned and they stretch down over a bridge that sticks out from the body which allows the vibrations to transfer to the body and be projected by the sound box. They usually have between 8 and 12 strings. Modern harps have 47 strings, which can all be flattened and sharpened, and the strings are all strung through the body for going the bridge that lyres utilise. On the subject of harps, the earliest harp that we found was discovered in an incredibly surprising place. Nah, not really, it was in ancient Mesopotamia. Documented by Francis Galpin in 1929, the Sumerian harp of Ur, circa 3500 BCE, is a paper he wrote about the unearthing at Ur. Just as a side note, it's really fun to read. Look at how excited he is. So yeah, alongside the lyres that were discovered at Ur, they also found some harps. Uh, Francis reckons that they're from 3500, which is a little bit earlier than uh, the lyres are dated to. That could just be old information, like it is from 1929, maybe they just didn't have the precise dates yet, uh, which would make complete sense. Or, alternatively, all the dates are wrong and they're actually from the future, being placed in the Royal Cemetery of Ur by a time-travelling prankster, just to make Francis Galpin look stupid. When you think of a lute, what do you see? A medieval minstrel, prancing around and playing the lute for his king perhaps, maybe a bard in an inn spinning tales of heroic knights and their many conquests. But they were in fact only brought to Europe in the Middle Ages, most likely during and after the Crusades in the 12th century, from Arabia. The predecessor to the Western lute is the Arabic oud, from which it's thought the name lute is derived. As it turns out, these ouds have a storied history and are still widely popular throughout Turkey, North Africa and the Middle East. The jury is still out on how ancient they really are, with some scholars believing them to be from the early centuries AD, as we have evidence of a predecessor to the Oud called a Barbat being depicted as early as the 1st century. On the other hand, musicologist Richard Dumbrill demonstrated that lute-like iconography has been present in Mesopotamia, dating to circa 3000 BC with his book The Archaeomusicology of the Ancient Near East. One example he gave was this cylindrical seal dating to at least 3000 BC. Bear in mind that I found several different versions of this exact seal being photographed but with different dates, uh, but all of them date to at least 2000 BC, so yeah. That's a 4000 plus year old lute-like thing being depicted right there. So lutes are probably going to be the most familiar ancient instruments to you in this video, as they are very similar to guitars that they did develop from a different branch of the chordophone family tree. An oud consists of a hollow, tear-shaped body, a fairly short neck and an angled head bearing the tuning pegs exactly like a modern guitar does. 
There are usually 11 strings, the first one on its own, and the following strings are in pairs of two, which are doubled. Uh, so basically they play the same note or, or an octave of the same note, which gives a more rich and resonant sound. They stretch from the tuning pegs on the head down the fretboard and to the bridge where the vibrations are transferred into the body, which is the resonation chamber. They usually play of a plectrum, but you may notice that there are no frets like a modern guitar usually has. This is because the system of scales commonly used on an oud are quite different to our western scales in that they often incorporate smaller note divisions. So, for example, we have 12 semitones between a C and an octave of that C, but in the Arab tone system they may have 24 quarter notes in that same tonal range. Having an neck that has no frets means the player can access all of those half-flat notes that are impossible to play on a fretted instrument by their very nature, because frets split up the system into 12 semitones, and that's just not possible to play the half-flat notes. So, we've established that musical bows are very ancient, developing of our cave painting prehistorical ancestors. Harps and lyres are quite ancient and were first developed by the Mesopotamians, and because they couldn't give it a musical rest, they had to make the ancestors to the lute too. But what of China, you may ask? I thought they invented everything. Well, disregarding your incredibly presuming attitude, yes, yes they did. Enter the Gu Qin. Zivers are classified by Encyclopedia Britannica as any stringed musical instrument whose strings are the same length as its soundboard. The word is German, though it's derived from the Greek word sitara, which also leads to the modern word guitar. Zivers of various types have enjoyed success across many different cultures, including Central Europe, North America, the Middle East and Asia, but this time China has just about managed to beat Mesopotamia to the punch. The oldest member of the Ziva family we have physical evidence of is a Chinese Gu Qin. The word Qin has been mentioned in writings as far back as 1000 BC, so we know it's at least 3000 years old. According to Chinese legend, the Qin dates back even further than that, at least to 3000 BC, which would make it 5000 years old, about as old as the instruments at Ur. God, I love dates. There are claims that the three legendary figures of Chinese prehistory, Fuxi, Shenong, and the Yellow Emperor, were all involved in its creation. But this is, of course, viewed as mythology now. But yeah, the Qin seems to be the OG Ziva, with the Japanese Koto and the Indonesian Sitter, and the Canon of Greece and the Middle East being developed in the centuries afterwards. So yeah, China got there first, I suppose. Also, a little fun fact. In 1977, NASA sent up Voyager 1 and 2, and on board each was a gold-plated LP containing sounds and images which are meant to portray the diversity of life and culture on planet Earth, with the intention being for some extraterrestrial beings to find them and to learn about Earth. A piece of Guchin music called Flowing Water, which is performed by Guan Pingu, was included on the record. 43 years and 5 months later, as of the recording of this video, Voyager 1 is 14.1 billion miles from Earth. That's some very far away Guchin. In terms of construction, the Guchin and many other types of ziva consist of a sound chamber formed by two long planks of wood glued together, which have sound holes in the bottom, and they're supported by feet so that it can be played on surface without blocking the sound holes. The strings are stretched over the body from a nut at one end to a bridge at the other end, so it's basically like having just the neck of a guitar be the entire instrument. The materials used tend to be very important and traditional. For example, the top wood usually must be made of tong wood, Chinese parasol tree, or Chinese paulonia, and the bottom is usually made of catalpa wood or camphor wood. Zivers are played traditionally by plucking the strings with the right hand and adding ornamentation such as vibrato and pitch slides with the left, though the playing techniques vary depending on the type of ziver, the player, and how many strings it has. And if there's anyone still watching this, it's time to talk about the here and the now. So now we know about the ancient origins of musical bows, lyres, harps, zivers and lutes. So how come in our modern western society we only really see the lute-like chordophones? If you ask any random person to name some stringed instruments, they'd probably say guitars and their bass variants, the orchestral strings like violins, violas, cellos and double basses, and maybe they'd add a harp or a banjo or a grand piano on the end as well. But the chances of them mentioning a lyre or a ziver are very slim. The recurring theme in the modern day is instruments that have a neck. For example, we don't really see the likes of zivers or lyres or musical bows being used in mainstream music, and I think there are some important design features that make the chordophones of necks so dominant in western culture, in particular guitars. 
those points being how well they project, how easy they are to learn, how portable they are, and finally how versatile they are. This is a modern acoustic guitar. As we can see, the body makes up about half the length of the entire instrument, which makes for a big, high volume sound box, which is great for projecting the sound loudly and with great clarity. This makes guitars excellent for projection, and by extension performance, because you don't need to mic them up to speakers or anything, because they're so good at projecting uh, out of the box. The second thing that I think makes necked chordophones so widespread is the fact that they're so easy to learn for beginners. For example, on guitar, all you need to know are the basic chords of D, C, G, and E, and you can play basically every song. I also think that guitars just look a lot less daunting to beginners. Like if you have a piano, you've got notes going from here all the way to here, and there's just a lot more in front of you. Or the harp, you've got 47 strings that stretch out well in front of you. With a guitar, all your notes that you're ever going to play are just here to here. Thirdly, necked chordophones are ridiculously portable. This is me carrying a bass and a guitar at the same time. And this is me carrying a keyboard, which is nowhere near the size of a piano or a harp. The final thing I'd like to mention is that necked chordophones are incredibly versatile. They play accompaniments really well, but they're equally happy playing melodic lines. They also have a much larger tonal range than lyres, zivers, or musical bows, without sacrificing size like a piano or a big harp does. I think this makes them the perfect happy medium between portability and versatility. So to round up, necked chordophones are better for performing than other stringed instruments, they're quicker to learn and less intimidating for beginners, and they provide the best medium between portability and versatility out of all chordophones. So in a roundabout way we've actually managed to answer the question, why do so many stringed instruments look the same? It's because this is just the best recipe for a stringed instrument that's accessible to everyone. And the next time you're plucking your harp or slapping your bass, just remember that all the members of the chordophone family probably started with just a string between two ends of a curved stick made by a preliterate person in a cave 15,000 years ago. That was the first video in my series, Instrumental Origins, and I'm sure I left out a lot of information about a good few things in this video, but I just wanted to broadly cover those five main categories of chordophone and why there's a preference for ones of necks now. I'll leave orchestral strings and pianos and modern guitars for another time because otherwise I literally could have gone on for hours. Of course, with all discoveries in historical and prehistorical contexts, there are always discrepancies and new things coming to light, and new methods always allow us to date things more precisely. I did see a lot of conflicting research about the first chordophone, when things were invented, what classifies as a harp or a lute or a guitar, etc. But basically I've gone with the things that seem to add up the most in my mind and make sense to me. Now. I don't always do educational videos, and I've never made a video showing my face so that was really scary, but I have tried to make it funny-ish, and if you like the format give the video a like because it genuinely helps, especially for small channels like this one, and then I'll know whether this is interesting to people and they want to see more things like this. Also feel free to comment about what you'd like to see and give me feedback because that's really useful, and interaction is very important to me and I'd love to see more of it. And as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.